Hi, Tampa Native Show fans. Mario Nunez here. It's Thursday at 7 o'clock, and tonight's Tampa Native Show fan is going to be a special one dedicated to a Tampa sports hero, Tampa sports legend, and all-around great guy, Mr. Rick Caceres. So call your neighbors. They're not going to want to miss this one. Jack Espinosa in studio to share his stories as well. Stay tuned, everybody, because the Tampa Native Show starts right now. I Remember Tampa, the way she used to be, the places we would run to, the faces we would see. Yes, I remember Tampa, those precious memories, a city rising on the move, a simple yet progressive groove. I remember Tampa. She remembers me yeah. She remembers me Welcome to the Tampa Native Show. Stay tuned now for the fastest 60 minutes in cable broadcast history. Live from the studios at TBCN, the home of the Tampa Native Show. Join your hosts, Mario Nunez, the 15-Minute Girl, and Steve Canella as they celebrate growing up in Tampa. From Shock Armstrong to Shakey's Pizza, from Braddock Street to Buffalo Avenue, get ready to call in and tell us your stories, because sharing your memories has never been this much fun. And now, Mario Nunez, the 15-Minute Girl, and Steve Canella. She remembers me. Hi Tampa Native Show fans, welcome back. It's Thursday night, 7 p.m. Verizon Channel 30, Bright House Channel 950, alongside the 15-Minute Girl and Tampa Steve, and of course, our esteemed guest this evening, Mr. Jack Espinosa. My name is Mario Nunez, and tonight we're gonna just have a wonderful time remembering one of Tampa's sports heroes, one of Tampa's icons, one of Tampa's legends, and all-around great guy, Mr. Rick Caceres. We understand at the outset of the show, we're having a little bit of a problem, technical problem, with, uh, with our feed online. So for those of you watching here in Hillsborough County on Channel 30 and 950, it's not going to concern you. This is for people that are out of state, out of town. Uh, currently the uh, website is down. We're trying to get that fixed. And we're also trying to figure out if there's an alternative web page that we can send you to so you can watch the feed from out of state. Hang in there with us. These things happen on live TV and in real time, and we're experiencing some of those difficulties tonight. So, Jack, we're going to go ahead and set the stage tonight by showing this video. It's about an 11-minute video. I know it's a little long, it's worth but it. it's entirely, entirely worth it. It's something that was put together by NFL Films and the Sable family. It highlights Rick Caceres. It has footage some of you may have never seen before. Some of you who have, like Jack, are going to get a chance to see it again for the first time in a long time. And it's uh, footage of Rick running roughshod all over the Detroit Lions also having his way with the Baltimore Colts. I think you're going to enjoy this. So let's go ahead and go to the, let's go ahead, we'll go to the video in just a couple of seconds. Um, and, uh, and enjoy that because it's going to be well worth the time. Jack, uh, thanks again for coming in. Thank you. Studio it's my with pleasure. Us. Um, it's been is, kind of a difficult time for all of us. Everything huh? is live. It's like Cuban television. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. If you, it, made, if you made a mistake in uh, Casino de la Alegría, <laughs> it remained, stayed. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. Awesome. Um, you know, uh, we, we've learned, I guess, uh, baptism by fire. Yes, we have. Yeah. At times, yeah. we've been sitting Well, at least you're not an old guy like me, and when you say live television, it makes me feel good <laughs> to be alive. And, you know. <laughs> we, had, we had actually the experience when we first came back Mm -hmm. to, uh, to TBCN, and they were just organizing the studio. Right. Yes, yeah. You guys recall? I, I um, remember that. Our very yes. first show back, mm -hmm. um, we did 45 minutes, and lo and behold, <laughs> uh, we thought we were going out over the air, and what they were showing was a video, a replay of, of a documentary on the Holocaust. It was yes. exactly right. And we thought we yeah. were broadcasting the Florida State Fair. So, yeah, so. Uh, ladies Whoopsie. and gentlemen, those things can happen, so without any uh, further ado, as they That's say, right. sometimes right. in the television business, mm -hmm. 
Enjoy this wonderful footage. We'll be back on the other side to tell you a little bit more about Rick. Take it away. Caceres was one of football's toughest characters. He looked like he could have been one of Al Capone's hired guns. Instead, the Bears' star runner of the 50s chose the Chicago backdrop to perform a different kind of mayhem. Fullback Rick Caceres, number 35, was a hard-edged kid out of Patterson, New Jersey, who brought his street smarts with him to the Chicago Bears. From 1955 through 1966, Caceres slashed through the back alleys of NFL defenses for over 5,600 yards and became pro football's toughest guy on the block. Rick Caceres was one of the most inspirational guys I ever played with. When you lined up in the huddle and you looked at Rick, you knew he was all business, and I really mean that. I, I saw the guy try to play a game with a broken ankle, and, and it, he, it was broken. Uh, he had shots, he put a high top shoe on, he had tape under, he had tape over. He went out and tried to play on it. It was exciting to get into a huddle with him and look at his eyes, because you knew that Rick Caceres was all man and all football. The only thing he wanted to do was play the best he could. He was a man's man to me. I mean, I just, uh, I idolized him because he was a tough guy that didn't wear it outside. He did everything by example. He did nothing by word. At age 14, Caceres fought on a phony birth certificate and won the New Jersey Middleweight Amateur Championship. Word spread quickly that this was not a man to be trifled with. Rick was a very nice guy. He was, he was a nice looking guy and a quiet, quiet spoken guy. Uh, but nobody ever messed with Rick Caceres. Uh, he had a reputation. I guess he did some boxing, golden glove boxing. And I just know nobody ever messed with him. I think that maybe one guy that even Doug Atkins wouldn't have messed around with. Rick just, uh, he was so nice that I just think, you know, you thought of him as being the true uh, silencer because if he had a, if he had a hit you, he would have silenced you. Red Hot Baltimore Colts, boasting an undefeated record in three National League games, invade Chicago's Wrigley Field for a rematch with one of their prior victims, the Chicago Bears. More than 40,000 fans watch as Baltimore's Allen the Horse Amici batters his way into Bear territory for a first down on the Bruin 36. When the Bears stall Baltimore's high-geared offense, Burt Retchishar kicks a 26-yard field goal that ends up in a fan's fishnet, and Baltimore leads Chicago 3-0. The Bears battle back. Big John Hoffman roars over the turf for 27 yards before being thrown out of bounds on the Colts' 42. On fourth down from 36 yards out, George Bland attempts a field goal. It's good, and after the first quarter, Chicago Bears three, Baltimore Colts three. Second period now, and gets set for the play of the day. Chicago's Rick Caceres takes a pitch out and skirts wide around Baltimore's left end. He cuts back and romps down the far sideline. A change of pace and a good straight arm enable Caceres to go the distance on a brilliant 81-yard touchdown run. Rick's run, the longest from scrimmage by a pro that gives the Bears a 10-3 advantage. Caceres receives a hearty reception from his happy teammates. Baltimore sensational George Shaw takes to the air lanes, but Burley Bear guard Bill George intercepts and brings the ball back to the midfield strike. On the next play, George Blanda outmaneuvers the Colts on a pass-run option play. Blanda spots lanky Gene Schroeder open downfield and hits him with a bullseye on the 10. Schroeder hot puts it into pay dirt for another bare six-pointer. At halftime, Chicago leads the undefeated Colts 17 to three. 
The Bears continue to roll in the third period. Big John Hoffman takes a pitch out and bulls eight yards closer to the Colt end zone. Hard running Bobby Watkins plows up the middle six yards to the Baltimore four. Rick Casares pushes across the final stripe for another Bear six pointer. The surprising Bears lead the Colts 24 to 3. Colt quarterback George Shaw tries to rally his forces. He pitches downfield, but Chicago's Charlie Sumner short circuits the toss and weaves his way 22 yards before being dropped inside the Baltimore five yard line. Bobby Watkins dives over the Colts left tackle and a quick opener for still another Chicago touchdown. It's Bears 31, Colts three after three period. Refusing to quit, the Colts' Gary Kerkorian unlumbers his pitching arm. He hits Ray Burry near the sideline, and Burry's thrown out of bounds on the Bear 8. This Bear can't bear being pushed and bounced about. He's full of fight, and the Colts will have no part of him. Alan Amici blasts into the end zone for a Baltimore score. The Colts narrow the Chicago margin to 31-10. The Bears want more. Bobby Williams fakes a run to the right, then pitches a 37-yard strike to Bill McCall for the touchdown that seals the victory. Landis' record, 115th consecutive conversion, finishes the scoring, and the mighty Chicago Bears bring the Baltimore Colts down to earth by handing them their first defeat, 38-10. to It's the game of the year in the Western Conference. The Detroit Lions versus the Chicago Bears in a winner-take-all affair. Nearly 50,000 fans fill Wrigley Field for this historic struggle. This climax is a great season for both teams, and on the outcome of this one game hinges the divisional championship. It's the Bears with the ball in the first quarter, and that's Rick Caceres, Chicago's bread and butter back, running rough shot over the Lions. Rugged Rick races away on a 33-yard rouser. The Lion line braces, but the Bears have the aces. George Bland booms the ball over the bar, and Chicago takes a 3 to nothing lead. Detroit comes on in the second quarter. Harry Gilmer paces the Lions with a pass to Jim Doran, and Doran dodges to the Bear 21. Gilmer filling in for the injured Bobby Lane connects with Billy Bowman. Bowman's a bull as he bowls over the Bears for a touchdown. And now Detroit leads. 7-3. Coming up is the play of the day. It's Rick Caseri's carrying and an enraged bunch of bears blocking everything that moves. Bill Whitkin, Harlan Hill, and J.C. Caroline throw key blocks on this 68-yard hair-raising run. Caseri's, the league's leading rusher, scores his 14th touchdown of the year to put Chicago back in front 10-7. By forcing the Lions to punt, the Bears get the ball right back, and away they go again. Ed Brown passing, Harlan Hill catching. Hill hurries like a halfback to the Detroit 24. We did say Hill at halfback, and that's just where he's playing. Harlan, an all-pro end, proves his versatility as he whips his way through the Lions for 13 yards. The Bears are pulling no punches today. Defensive demon J.C. Caroline is pressed into action on offense. And what action he provides. Chicago holds the upper hand at the half, 17-7. In the third quarter, Chicago attempts to spring another surprise as Bill McCall passes on an end-around play. But the Bears are caught in their own trap. Yeah, Larry intercepts for Detroit. It looks like Larry's off to the races, but J.C. Caroline drops him with a diving tackle on the Chicago 17. Harry Gilmer makes the lion roar louder with a pass to Dave Middleton on the Bears' two-yard line. 
Leon the Lion Hart drills into the end zone to put Detroit right back in the game. The Lions trail now by just 17-14. The Bears are a determined bunch. Rick Caseri's the Florida Flash, playing his greatest game, grinds out a 15-yard game as Chicago bids to lengthen its lead. Ed Brown, Chicago's long-distance passer, throws from behind a wall of protection. Harlan Hill has the Lion defenders out distance for a honey of a 47-yard touchdown. This gives the Bears a 24-14 third-quarter margin. Chicago's tremendous charge carries into the fourth period. Rick Caceres, who carried for 190 yards, gets away on his favorite pitch-out play for 13 yards. The Bears roll on. J.C. Caroline spins to the Detroit 19. Caroline, the former Illinois All-American, carries on a pitch out this time, and he hurdles to the Lions 7. Bullet Bob Watkins shoots through the middle for another Bear touchdown. The Bears appear unbeatable today with a 31-14 ball. Harry Gilmer passes in a do-or-die effort to rally the Lions, but Detroit is dead. Joe Fortunato intercepts, and the big linebacker barrels to a touchdown. This puts the Bears on top, 38-14 late in the game. The Lions, who led the league 90% of the season, are still fighting. Gilmer hits Dorn Dibble for 15 yards. Gilmer throws another. Jim Dorn takes it. Now watch this tackle by Ray Smith, who smears Dorn on the Chicago 16. A Gilmer to Dibble touchdown pass only dents the Big Bear lead. Chicago wins 38 to 21, paced by the powerful running of Rick Caceres and a savage supercharged defense. The Chicago Bears win their first Western Conference crown in two years and will next meet the New York Giants for the World Championship. We're so glad you enjoyed that, ladies and gentlemen, and it was a pleasure to bring that to you. Thank you once again uh, to NFL Films uh, for the use of that wonderful archived footage. Uh, the Sable family has done nothing but record all of that wonderful mm -hmm. NFL history for the last 50 plus years. Of course, we just lost Steve Sable last year as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rick, uh, excuse me, we're going to be talking about Rick because he's mm -hmm. on my mind. We're going to go to Steve Canella right now at our IT department. He's got something very important that he needs to say to all of our audience. Okay, Stevie, take it away. Yeah, let's let's do four it. shot. Well, we do have a workaround with the issue with the, um, the Ustream feed. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is go to Ustream.com, type in the search bar at the very top. In fact, I have it right here. Type in uh, TBCN. Just type in TBCN. It mm -hmm. stands for Tampa Bay Community Network. Up in this little search box right here, if you can see it. So go to Ustream.com, type in TBCN, hit enter, or the little magnifying glass search, search tool. It'll take you right to the uh, page, thank as you, you see now. So, Thank Good. you for that. We'll continue to update as the uh, show progresses. We've got a phone caller on line four. Let's go to our caller on line four, Jack. Let's see who's calling. I would have been caller, down. caller, you're on the air with the Tampa Native Show. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Mike Ditka. Mike Ditka. Mike Ditka. This is Coach Mike Ditka? Well, yes. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Coach, we want to hear something from you about uh, Rick Caceres, our dear friend Rick Caceres that we lost last month. And we met you at the funeral, and we were so pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you. Coach, we know you guys were close. Tell us something that you remember about Rick. Tell us a fond remembrance. He's just the greatest guy I've been around. I mean, I've met a lot of good guys over life. I had a very few guys that I admired for the way they lived their life and the way they played the game of football. He was a tough guy. But he was a general guy. Uh, I think everybody kind of related to him, guys and girl, girls at that time. And he kind of, I, I don't know, he was kind of ahead of his time. You know, he knew people in Chicago and Florida and L.A. Uh, and, and when I can always remember when we, we go on trips, uh, you know, everybody would take, uh, you know, a sport coat and, and whatever we asked. We had, Rick would have three suits, you know, three ties, three shirts. You know, he'd be all decked out. He, I have a different outfit on all the time because... 
he was dapper. He was a gentleman. He dressed uh, he dressed immaculately, and uh, I mean, he, he was just an impressive man to me. I, I I was a kid when I met him. I was twenty, just turned twenty one, and uh, he kind of became the guy that I piled around with and uh, looked up to. So he was a hero of mine. Tell us, tell us, coach, because I I, I can't. I can't let you go without asking you to recount that one story that you told us at his funeral uh, with Ray Nitschke involved. I believe it was Co I believe it was Ray Nitschke. The the one uh, that you told at his funeral. I thought it was amazing. Well, we were in a we were in a bar after the game. It was a preseason game up in Milwaukee, and uh, I put a real hard block on Nitschke during the game, and he wasn't really happy about it. And so I was in there with Rick and a couple guys, and uh, he came up and. Uh, want to go outside and I said well come on Ray you know it's a football game you know it's it's uh, no big deal and all of a sudden he says well uh, Rick steps in he said yeah you you fight me first and then you can fight your kid <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of big hearted and Rick never said a word he never you know he was a quiet guy he never said anything you know I remember one time he was with a, a date and some guy said something smart to him he took the guy outside and kicked his butt really good. <laughs> it, it was a really a, a not of a, you know a really a rude statement he made to the lady, and Rick didn't appreciate. It. He said, "Let's go outside." And the guy thought he was a big tough guy because he was a big guy. Sure, <laughs> they sure. dropped him in one punch. You know, he was, sure that's what happened. So it, 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 but he was a gentle guy. He wasn't a guy that ever looked for anything. But sure, back away from it either. So I you know, I, I think uh, I, I mean I play, he played a game. I remember. Uh, we uh, and it was at 62, I think. Uh, he actually he broke he broke cracked the, the non weight bearing bone in his leg. Oh, oh man! And he played the whole game with the damn thing. He had, oh. a, he probably had a high top shoe on that one leg. It was right up his ankle. I never forgot that. I mean, he, you know, and that was you know he took an injection before the game, took an injection at halftime, and he played the whole game and played pretty darn well. I mean, and it was you know you know it had to hurt. I don't care how many how much. Thank you for adding it. Yeah. And he probably never complained a lick. Never never did. He never did. And, you know, I don't know that everybody, people in those days, I'm not sure the owner, the coach, anybody appreciated you know, how, how much the players in those days, you know, they played. They played for the pride. They played for their contract. They played for their team. And, you know, they, they, you know, if they had a boo-boo, they weren't going to sit out if they, if they didn't have to. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's just the way it was. But that's the way Rick was. Well, Coach, we, we appreciate so much you being available to us tonight and, and calling in the show. It means a great deal to us personally here mm -hmm. on the set, <coughs> to, our, Say hello to, to, uh, to our fans. Uh, Jack Espinosa is on, on set with us. We're going to be talking with him at length in just a couple of minutes. But we, we, we wanted to just thank you once again for, uh, for being a special part of our show tonight. Right. I, thank, I thank you for including me, and I thank uh, so much that I was fortunate enough to be one of Rick's friends uh, through those early years, though. So. You guys had a great run, Coach. You and Paul Horning, you guys had a great run. Uh, Paul's my buddy. I, I just talked to him yesterday. He's a good man. Thank you, Coach. We'll, we'll I'll be checking in with you again real soon. We appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye. It was great. Wow, wow I got goosebumps, yeah. man. That's Something, huh? the great yeah. Mike Ditka calling in the, uh, yeah. the humble little show. Tampa Native yeah. show. So that's, that's for the coach right the there. Oh. What do you think about that? Unbelievable. Well, you know, he said a few things that – you know, that almost I could have said about Rick in high school. Yeah. And he never changed. You know, he was the same guy. Yeah. And he's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I was talking about, uh, you talk about a tough guy. Sure. Same thing happened, exactly what uh, Mike was talking about in high school. Somebody had a slurry remark about a girl that he was dancing with at the senior prom. We went out and finally the guy wanted to fight Rick and Rick tried to talk him out of it. And we a big guy. He was already trained, player. too. He was, right. he was a golden bar. <laughs> golden champion, bar. Right? And everybody knew it. But this guy was a little, you know, he was a big football player. Mm. And we went outside, and Rick tells me, Jackie, you know how he talked. He says, hold my coat. <laughs> and I held his coat. He says, Henry, you sure you want to? Come on. Boom. One shot. And it was over. He says, Jackie, give me my coat. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he had this jersey, but it was not a jersey accident. It was, it jersey was, West Tampa. It was affected. It was a West Tampa jersey. There you go. Then, you know? He All gave right. it a different sling, a little class, you know? Because he, in Jersey, and he has the ears right here, you know, one of those. Yeah. But he was, Jekyll, yeah. you're the greatest. 
And I used to run like hell, you know, in track when I was, and I used to, I used to outrun them. And he said, you're, you're the regular will of the wisp. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. I mean, everybody yeah, loved him because, September. and he wasn't putting on. No, so it was who he was. Sure the was. way he was. You know, Let's see who's him. calling in. And talk like about a noble person, man. No, <laughs> nobility to the end. Let's see who's, great. who's calling in. Uh, caller. You're on the air with the Tampa Native Show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Davis, and I'm calling from Chicago. Hmm. Hi, Jeff Davis from Chicago. Jeff, is this your first time calling the show? Yes, it is. Well, <laughs> we always ring a bell for our first-time callers, <laughs> and, and we're having a little bit of an issue tonight. I know that uh, we talked earlier today, and, and uh, you were going to try to watch our show. You can still watch our show, Jeff. It's just that the website here is down currently, but if you, if you were to go to the website... Uh, ustream.com and then type in in the search box TBCN which is Tampa Bay Community Network you'll be able to pick up the feed but let me also say this show will be uploaded on our website by this weekend tonight actually. probably well by tonight we understand our IT department's going to be hot after this <laughs> so so you'll be able to see it tomorrow morning with a with a fine cup of uh, of coffee in the morning okay. Jeff tell every Tell everybody who you are that might not know who you might be. Well, I, I uh, wrote a book uh, for McGraw Hill a few years ago called Papa Bear. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, life and legacy of George Hallis, who uh, was Rick Caceres' coach. He was the founder of the National Football League and also the owner and the coach of the Bears uh, from 1920 until his death in 1983. He, he stopped coaching after the 1967 season because he was 72 years old, so... Uh, but he, he was definitely the owner and the boss, and he was Hallis's, uh, Hallis, Hallis uh, had a lot of great players, made more Hall of Famers than anybody else, and uh, more retired numbers and everything, and, but a guy who uh, he really liked and, and appreciated was Rick Caceres, who was as fine a football player as I've ever seen. We just had the uh, good fortune uh, to, to speak for a good few minutes with uh, Coach Mike Ditka, who was sharing some of his recollections as well. And, and of course, Mike had the opportunity as a rookie to be taken underneath uh, Rick's wing, uh, quite uh, figuratively and literally, as a big wing. Uh, well, they, were, they were big wings, all right, but I, I don't think Ditka needed a lot of uh, <laughs> well, uh, hand-holding either. He, uh, he learned from the best. I know Ditka was a pretty tough guy. and, and, and uh, Tell everybody, because you had the opportunity, Jeff, to... Uh, to get to know Rick very well as you were writing and doing the research for Papa Bear. Uh, you became close friends with Rick and, and remained close friends really up until his death. I did. I, I got to know him actually maybe 20 uh, years ago, uh, well before I wrote this book. Uh, uh, he came into Chicago uh, for a uh, for a alumni reunion for the Bears with Polly, his wife, who was just the most wonderful woman and uh a great lady and a lot of fun and uh we we hit it off right away and we always have ever since we'd stay in touch and uh finally when i started this thing he was he was great he gave some of the best interviews of anybody and he had he had so much to say about everything and boy did he and he he knew like so many of these guys they remember every play in detail it's amazing isn't it it's amazing yep and he sure did. I think if you if you pressed him on it, he could probably go all the way back to his high school days when he was running around the track with Jack Espinosa, ha cutting up and having a great time, and uh, and remember all of those things in, in wonderful detail. In spite of the fact that you know as well as I do, they played with inferior equipment back then, and they went head first, and they didn't have a chance to run out of bounds because Papa Bear would have none of that. Well, that's not the way you played. <laughs> that's right. That, and we just showed at the beginning uh, an 11-minute uh, video that when you get a chance to see this on the archive uh, on our website, I think you'll appreciate some of those games that you saw, the early games against Detroit in that magical uh, season of 56 when Rick set the, uh, the league record with 14 touchdowns and over 1,100, 1,200 yards rushing. Um, uh, that We show that footage. And, you know, the one thing we come away with when you watch that is – the man was just an animal. He was big enough to run away from defensive backs, and if he if he got found himself in the interior line, he would he would shrug him off with a, a right arm, a forearm shiver, much like a wrestling move or a boxing move as it was, and off he went. He was, uh, you know, guys I talked to, and that was including Mike Ditka, 
I had Paul Herring. Paul Herring said he's the toughest man I ever met in my life. Period. And yet the paradox there was that he was also the kindest spirit and the most gentle-hearted man. You talk to anybody, man, woman, child that knew him, that knows him, that Jack grew up with him, and they'll tell you the same thing. If you need whatever you needed, he would literally, he's the guy that would literally give you the shirt off of his back. And, and, I, and it was a big shirt, by the way. Yeah, it sure was. He was generous to a fault. To a fault. He always dressed perfectly. At all times, he uh, he was sharp and uh, and uh, and just absolutely the most delightful person to be with. I I am uh, sad in one one regard, but very glad that I got to speak to him uh, only a couple of days before he passed. Mm. Well, uh, and I was I was asking if he was going to be able to come up, and he said, "Well, I, his doctor said uh, didn't think so this year because he had to have a, a pacemaker yep. adjusted. I didn't even know he had one." Uh, and he made an annual pilgrimage to Chicago because yeah. even though even though his playing days were better than 50 years ago, whenever they would have those uh, festivities where uh, former players would come in to sign autographs, Rick was still remembered, revered, and loved there, and he would have the longest lines in front of him. Is that is that correct, Jeff? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of years ago, he he came up with uh, some uh, with a lot of his old teammates and friends, and they had a uh, autograph show. Uh, out near O'Hare Airport at a uh, big hall out there and uh, uh, he had as long a line as anybody I've seen out there. Everybody, and, and he, he gave everybody a shot to have a picture with him and, uh, and w had a kind word for each person. That's amazing. That's amazing. Know, he, he was a guy who uh, say, let's go to dinner, partner, and then, as you know, and then, and then you say, oh, well, Let's let's uh, divvy up or and I said no. I that doesn't that's not the way I work. Mm -hmm. I pay. That's well. true, and believe me, would you, would you argue with the man? No, 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 no. We were just talking about that before you called in. That that you know would have been a hell of a battle between him and Rocky Marciano because I don't know either one of those two would have backed up. And I didn't know this. But uh, Jack uh, had met Rocky in Cuba while they were working uh, in, in, in the nightclub circuit over there. Oh. And Rocky was brought in as a guest to do some stuff. Shortly after he retired in 56, uh, Rocky, even though he was slight of stature, 5'9", had enormous hands. And that's where all that thunder came from. But, of course, Rick's hands were legendarily large. So I don't know. I wouldn't have wanted to be ringside there because that would have been scary. <laughs> it, it is something uh, I've... Many person, many guys I've talked to uh, said Rick might have been the heavyweight champion of the world had he, had he devoted himself to boxing. Uh, pretty, pretty sure that he would have. Pretty sure that he would have, and I think Ferdy Pacheco would back that up, the fight doctor himself, because, of course, he, he was in Mohammed's corner for how many years, and, uh, That's right. and he said himself that, that Rick was a special, special guy in the ring, and, and boy, did he pack thunder himself. Uh, Jeff, we, we just so pleased that you called. You know, one of my bucket list items, one of our bucket list items here at the Tampa Native Show was to have Rick on the, sh on the set with us and, and recount some of his stories. It didn't happen, unfortunately, for us, but we're, we're very grateful that you called in and that Coach Ditka yeah. called in because we feel like we have him on the set with us. You know, few, few people knew him better than you guys. Of course, Jack also. Indy yeah. Quest is another gentleman that comes to mind. But thanks so much for calling in and yeah. sharing your stories tonight. You're absolutely welcome, and I know how much he loved uh, Jefferson High School <laughs> uh, and the community uh, and uh, Ybor City and everything else about Tampa, which is uh, uh, absolutely uh, one of our favorite places, too. My wife and I come down every year uh, and uh, make a point of uh, getting to the Columbia. Your book is still available on, on, uh, online, and I, I'm assuming at, at, at bookstores? It stores? is. Uh, you can go through Amazon or just look it up online, Papa Bear, uh, and uh, it's there. It's and, a good uh, read. It's a good read. I, I, I went through it uh, you know, pretty quickly, and I was really excited when I got to the parts that, that spoke about Rick Caceres, because, of course, it, it was all about... Well, there's nothing <laughs> like his talking about getting his contract when uh, he went to Hallis, and, uh, and, and Rick said... You know, Coach, I, I, I love this game so much, I'd play it for nothing, he said. And the worst thing he ever said was still <laughs> that because people took him up on him. it. To him, son, that's not why we play this game. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Great. you so much, Jeff, Thank for you. calling. We appreciate it. And listen, when you get to Tampa the next time, please look us up. We'd love to meet you for a Café con Leche yeah. and, uh, and share some stories. And talk it to sounds you. wonderful, and we sure will. Thank right. you, Jeff. Thank you. Bye-bye okay. now. All right.
about that? Wow. What a nice man. Awesome. Beautiful. But look, everybody, beautiful everybody that, uh, that calls love, in. Love, full of love. Uh, yeah, it's look like, uh, it looks like what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. No, it validates everything I, that you it, You know, it, 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 we, I say it from, from a high school sure. mm -hmm. and college, and then when I went to the pros, you know, I, you know, I, I worked a nightclub in Chicago. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we got together there. And what I was, was just like? talking about that. I, how he Give us always a year on that. Give us a year on that for perspective. What well, in the 50s. Middle, late 50s. That, that was, well, yeah. Okay, he's, he's in his glory. He's yeah, when he was in the top of the line. Yeah, 56, 57. And I worked at a, a nightclub called the Blue Dot. And, of course, I looked up Rick, right? He was, um, so anyway, there was uh, some people sitting around, and they were all over him. And uh, me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not used to sitting in the back row, but I, you know, I understood perfectly. Where the hell am I, right? Of course. So finally, one of them had a little snide remark of like, now who's this, you know? And Rick, Sounds he said, strange. this guy is, and he talked about me, and he talked about me, and then he said, he doesn't have to take a back seat to nobody. And, you know, those are things you remember. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. He didn't have to do, you know. I didn't care anyway, but it's just, the way he, sure they, they talk about this, but you see, when you live it, yeah. and his humbleness was not a put on thing. You know, mm -hmm. people, some people say, well, here, uh, I'm famous, uh, therefore, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to be humble. Right. Right. So they yeah. acted. Yeah. But it, with him, he was uh, uncomfortable, uh, obviously. When you, and he had a way of deviating that praise and putting on on you or on somebody sure. else. Yeah. Yeah. Indy, Indy, Indy Cuesta, but you know, Indy Cuesta was a phenomenal football player. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the old single wing, the quarterback was the blocking back. You know, Rick played halfback mm -hmm. his first two years. They mm -hmm. put him in fullback his last year in high school because he, and he threw, he could throw passes from here to Clearwater. Mm -hmm. And he could kick the ball up out of the stadium. I don't know why they never used him to kicking. He yeah. kicked, you he know, though. He punted, I'm talking about a punt 60 yards in high school, wow. unheard of, it had been Phillips high Field, top it almost got the river, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so, you know, and with all that that he had going to, uh, for him, he shunned it off, and Indy Cuesta was the blocking back. Hmm. So, whenever they were talking about it, and Indy was around, uh, he would say things like, uh, wait a minute, this is the guy that made me look good. Those were his lines. I mean, so exactly. So I was pumping words, everybody else up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, Rick would have been a super athlete anywhere he went. Yeah. But the truth was that Indy Cuesta was a big part of that in that formation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Indy was a big boy, and he was <laughs> an animal. I mean, you know, how'd you like to try to tackle those two guys coming through no. off tackle? Woo! Come on. <laughs> and you're a 140-pound defensive back. The defensive back, the safety, that's what I play. The safety coming 90 miles an hour is like a mosquito hitting you at 400 Imagine. miles an hour. But those guys would run over those people. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, that's what made them, really. We've got a caller online for Jack. Let's see who's Let's calling. See. Caller, you're on the air with the Tampa Native Show. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Mario, this is Dennis Antonori, and I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Atlanta, Georgia. Dennis Antonori. Is this the first time you call our show, Dennis? It is. Well, <laughs> that's for you because everybody that calls the first time gets their bell rung. Gets their bell rung. <laughs> and isn't that appropriate because yes. tonight we're talking yeah. about a man who rang a few bells in his days. Huh? <laughs> we, we know that Rick was amazing on the gridiron. We've been talking tonight to uh, Coach Mike Ditka. He called in a little bit earlier. We also had... Uh, Jeff Davis just called before you, the author of Papa Bear and, and Close Confidant. He got to know Rick real well, but even more now, your family. So we, we would appeal to you, Dennis, to tell us uh, your recollection of your cousin and, um, and, and share some of those moments with us. I'd be happy to, but first of all, let me thank you and, and Jack and all those that have really been so uh, instrumental in, in getting Rick the recognition that I know we all... Uh, believe he's due with the uh, field house at Jefferson, hopefully to be dedicated in his honor in the near future. That, that's a real testament to it's our pleasure, the folks, and we, we really do appreciate it and the family. Uh, you know, one, one thing I do want to mention, too, along this lines is I've taken it upon myself with a new mission I've got, and that's to uh, not only would we love to see Rick in the hall, but uh, I'd love to see his number retired by the Bears, and I've written... Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. McCaskey, the chairman of the board, and they've written a letter, you know, appealing to them to give Rick some consideration. So uh, anyone out there listening, uh, probably more voices uh, sending that message would be uh, 
would be better than just one voice out here in the uh, in the world asking that. I think that'd be a great recognition. We will yeah. work with you, Dennis, hand in hand, and you know if we can if we can dovetail that in, perhaps with that second bite or third bite, if that's what it's gotten down to, uh, with the Veterans Committee and the NFL, perhaps. If the NFL Veterans Committee will see to it to put Rick in the hall, which we rightfully believe he should be there, then then it might put a little bit of pressure on the backside. Mm -hmm. The Bears would have to then consider retiring his yeah. number. I'm just saying that may be the, the <coughs> order of things, the natural order. And if, if the Veterans Committee passes, we can still make an appeal. Hell, if we got to load the wagon up and get up to Chicago, man, why not? Absolutely. <laughs> well, right, we, Chip. We've been talking tonight about Rick and his... Uh, larger than life character, the fact that he was uh, humble to a fault, his humility as a human being, uh, his athletic prowess has always spoken for itself and stood alone. You were his cousin. I want you to tell uh, our audience so we can get it on uh, video and into perpetuity that mm -hmm. wonderful story you told us at his funeral about uh, being seven years old, I believe it was, and going up to the University of Florida uh, after your abuela concha packed the car full of food. Now, was I listening at the funeral? You were, you were, and I tell you, uh, you know, we, we made many of those trips, and uh, uh, they were always memorable because Rick, uh, you know, he, he made it so special for the family that when they arrived to always be with us. I have a, a great picture of Rick with my mom and uh, her, her sister, you know, after a game, his hands, his arms wrapped around him, and it was just, uh, it was always so special because he made everyone that came up to those games special and you know when we was with the bears similarly we traveled to jacksonville on the train and with uh, our packed uh, meals from grandma going to and my well molly and you know just wonderful food and companionship and great times with him there i mean he was he's, he's, he was an incredible human being how, how fortunate you were and of course your your cousin rick as well rick caceres uh, excuse me um uh, ernie caceres how fortunate you both were to kind of have been right there at his knee man and you know for for those of us that we i've said this before uh that jack was a contemporary jack was one of his friends from childhood and then there was the age group that uh was uh, represented by jeff davis who wrote the book who looked up to him uh idolized him as an athlete and, and then there are those that in my age group and a little bit younger that looked at him as a myth a legend and almost almost godlike because he was just not only physically big but he Tremendous wake he cut. Am I right, Zach? Tremendous oh, yeah. wake he cut. So how fortunate you were, Dennis, to, you know what I mean? If you needed to go see your cousin and hang out with him, you had him right there. I did. And, you know, even in the in his latter years here, we, we still had wonderful times together. You know, the thing about Rick that people probably that know him will recognize, it was, was certainly the warmth and sincerity that he had. But, you know, he had a generous side of him. His heart was bigger than, than, than life. Uh, you know, he would, when you went out with him, don't try to pick up a, a dinner bill. Don't try to pick up a drink bill. Don't try to pick up anything because he would not have any part of it. Mm -hmm. you know, and who's going to argue with that guy? <laughs> Did you see the mitts on that guy? <laughs> no, you, you definitely wouldn't. And, and he would he would certainly put those mitts out there if you tried to reach for it. I would think so. I would think he'd lay one on your shoulder and go, I got this, pal. I got this one, pal. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and you know, when he had the huddle there on Dale Mabry sure. for its current then, you know, I wondered how he stayed in business those years because any of his friends would come in. You know, <laughs> Give it all away. Buying drinks. He, I think he spent more out of me. his pocket than people coming in as, as guests. Well, we are, we're just, uh, you know, all of us in the Tampa uh, family. Uh, we, you know, we're not going to see his likes again. I think it's fair to mm -hmm. say that he was a unique, one of a kind, uh, and he, he put us on the map. We owe a tremendous debt of gratitude uh, for what he did uh, representing us in such mm -hmm. a, a, a you know an upstanding like you say humble I mean he is the standard bearer you know we we always like our heroes to be humble and uh, and Rick certainly uh, led the path and and we owe him a debt of gratitude for that we're going to do all we can to make sure that we he's not forgotten and uh, and we thank you Dennis so much for sharing your story now promise us this when you get back to town we'll get together uh, next week okay I'll give you a call. Good deal, Dennis. Good deal. So thank you so much. Um, Thanks for calling. Again, you know, as we move forward, uh, you know, you, you have to remember that um, we, we feel it too. Certainly not as much as you do, but uh, I promised Jack tonight that if he got weepy, 
Uh, I was going to step on his feet under the table because he's real close to me. But uh, we just we appreciate you calling so much. Hey, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Bye bye now. Isn't that wonderful? Some great quotes. Yeah, what do you have there? You have some notes in front of you well, as we get well, close to the Yes, uh, we are yeah, at the 15 know. minute mark. So go. Oh, take it away. Go, 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 Jack. 15 right. minutes to go. Yeah. 15 minutes? Oh. All for me. All for you. I'm sorry. Fortunately, Jack. I've come prepared. <laughs> Hit it, Jack. <laughs> well, no, <clears throat> when Rick, <clears throat> when he first came to, uh, to Tampa, he came in from New Jersey, mm -hmm. and he was long and lanky. He's not the guy you saw there. Um, he was actually, he wasn't fast. He was just big, and, but he was kind of, and as soon as he started getting it together, it was very, very soon. Yeah. It's just that he grew too fast. Right. Yeah. But in the ninth grade, he was already, you know, all city and all everything. So for a Jefferson High School, we had 800 kids. Uh, we were not underdogs. <clears throat> you know, we were subterranean canines <laughs> i mean we were down. that's funny we were nobody we had nothing mm -hmm. not only that all the kids that went to jefferson were from west Tampa, rebor cities first generation born here of immigrant parents which i've talked about before in my yeah. first book and on our show so we mm -hmm. already felt underdog to start with sure yeah. okay our parents didn't understand mm -hmm. and were scared to death of the new country mm -hmm. so we came up with a uh, uh, fear of a postman in a uniform because you know in Spain <laughs> a guy in a uniform could hit you over the head if yeah. you looked at him wrong so we came up with that and then of course we had to deal with each other so we already had that complex kind of uh, you know so when we got to high school and we began to feel our muscle a little bit we became very uh, angry we, we had a, 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 I use the term a bad case of pisophory because we had something to prove all the time. Right. That with yeah. this chip on our shoulder, sure. yeah. you know, was, you know, half a ton. Yeah. So that when Rick, uh, Rick represented that, mm -hmm. in other words, so we didn't have anything going for us except that chip, yeah. something to prove. And we were angry. Sure. Angry. Mm -hmm. and, being that, and the coaches intelligent, they put us you know to that uh, the football was a good sure. thing not yeah. that me i hurt my knee before i even yeah. got to high school but i was in the track team and rick was you know uh, we, we were that way and even you know five guys went to the state track meet i mean we had landon and jackson we were in the big 10. Mm -hmm. the big 10. Ten i mean rick Casares was a whale yeah. a blue whale in a bucket <laughs> i mean he was bigger what so an you analogy. can if That's you can imagine yeah. how he was praised Sure. You have no idea how famous he was in that little village that we call Tampa at that time. What? All state, all southern, and in his senior year, we didn't even know there was an All-American High School. Wow. Wow. And then he made All-American High School. So you can imagine. Wow. Now, for a kid that good. age yeah. to handle it the way he did at that age. Yeah. yeah. 16, 17, but 18? He... He mm. was the same there as uh, these gentlemen talking about yeah. when he was in the pros. Mm. That's the way he was. Mm. And that's why everybody loved him. Yeah. He was in the senior class play with me. Now, <laughs> now he, he played the lead and mother was a freshman was our, the, the, the play. Mm -hmm. And I played the professor, if you can imagine that, okay, and white hair and all this. And he was the leading guy, the good looking guy. And he was, had a scene where he was gonna kiss uh, the, the leading uh, lady who was uh, one of the cheerleaders playing the part, playing mother who went to. And a kiss in a high school play on the Jefferson stage, which by the way is where they played basketball because we didn't oh, have a gym. Man. And uh, he, he, I'm supposed to walk in and catch him in the kiss. And they, they wanted to get, you know, they couldn't, you know, but, and, you know we were <laughs> animals about women, right? <laughs> And he's being so bashful because it was, and finally he, he loses his line and he plants a kiss on oh, the no. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> And I'm, I walk in on it and I gave it that. And every, and the place tore apart. Okay? <laughs> Made the play. And you know, we, I, I, I wrote it in my new book, you know, about that because I was about show business. Yeah. And I was on the same stage and we were actors together. He was in my homeroom. And when the track that we had, I was telling 
the, the track that we had was at Plymouth Park. Mm -hmm. There was no track. They measured around. And they put and the and symbolically, it was in front of a cemetery. Oh wow! <laughs> wow. Oh, you know, so if it, you know, and we made the track. It was grass, but after a while, it turned into sand. So I used to call it this famous Dragon Sahara, <laughs> and that we could have been great track stars. In, uh, in, the, in the Sahara, because we had feet like camels from, from <laughs> running on the, in the sand. In the sand. Funny. Uh, Jack, I, I wanna I wanna share uh, something that uh, we got about seven eight minutes to go yes. on the show. Yes. I, it's Far. unbelievable. But I, I did have the occasion today um, to to speak with Mr. Ferdy Pacheco, who lives in Miami, who was also uh, a, a friend of Rick's throughout their life. And you know, Rick also had his little brush with. Uh, uh, his own version of the Hollywood rich and famous and movie stars and so forth because uh, rumor has it, legend has it, that he hung out with Nat King Cole a bit and, and we didn't talk about I this. with Nat King Cole in Cuba. And, and yeah. we didn't talk about this, but Rick was also way ahead of the game in the, in the way of race relations because Rick didn't, Rick saw every man for the man that they were yeah. and he didn't see white, black, and different. You know, mm -hmm. he, he was that kind of a man. His so, justice was right. through and through. Yeah. My goodness, I've got, uh, well, we've got to go to caller on line four, and mm -hmm. I'm going to try to keep mm -hmm. this brief, and then I'm going to go ahead real quick and get to my uh, Ferdy Pacheco phone call. Mm -hmm. Caller, you're on the air. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Uh, my name's Ernie Caceres, and I'm calling from Tampa. Well, Ernie Caceres, is this the first time you call our show? Yes, sir, it is. There it is, and don't you <laughs> serve me, but I appreciate that. Listen, Ernie. We have been talking today uh, about your cousin Rick, and I tell you, everybody who has called the show today has shared with us uh, the man that he was at his essence. We, we showed a video at the top of the show and we know what kind of an athlete he was. We'd like to ask you to share with us briefly because we're almost running out of time your experience, maybe one of your fondest childhood memories of your cousin Rick. Well, I, you know, I, I remember our conversation uh, at the funeral, uh, Mario, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously the, the cherished moment in my life uh, which really kind of set the sails for me in so many ways. Uh, it was mentioned the fact that, uh, that the family would go up there packed to, packed to the hilt with food for everybody, and Rick was always keeping us involved in everything. And as a seven-year-old kid, uh, I would had the pleasure of being there, and, and being at a place like Gainesville, like for us, was like going to the end of the world mm -hmm. back in those days. And... Uh, after the game, Rick coming out and taking myself, my brother, I believe Dennis was there as well, and five or six of our other cousins took us into the locker room. And, and as we were walking through the locker room, we, there, there was a, a, a hamper full of, uh, what the, I guess they would call practice balls. Mm -hmm. And he gave each and every one of us a practice ball. Wow. And that was one of the most cherished gifts that I can ever recall. I am 66 years old. And I still think of that football. I, I, I long ago wore it out when I was a kid. But it was that kind of kindness that so many people speak about. And, and I, w I was so overwhelmed by the, the, the statements that you know, co people like Coach Ditka and, and Paul and so many others uh, were saying about Rick. Of course, it was always something that we knew. But it was always something that we knew, but we didn't realize that other people understood it as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Ernie, we're, we're so fortunate. Uh, just really uh, picking his words very carefully when he spoke, and he was always so kind. We're, yeah. we're very fortunate to <clears throat> have had him in our lives, uh, those of you that were in his family even more so. But uh, he set the bar high for the rest of us. He certainly did. And... Uh, He's uh, unique and, and, and certainly never be forgotten. And we're going to do all that we can to make sure that his name is uh, somewhere on a building, uh, on a bronze statue, somewhere in the Hall of Fame, if we can get that done. We, we're out of time and, and cer certainly glad that you called tonight, Ernie. And, and please, when we get together with Dennis, you be there with us as well. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much Mary, for everything you've done. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Let me just play this recording real quick, and I'll play just a minute of it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Ferdy Pacheco earlier today talking a little bit about <clears throat> Rick. Rick is a, is a name that, that, that God is a, a hero. It's a, it's, it's a name of hero, Rick Caceres. I mean, you, you don't get more heroic than that. And this guy, I, I saw him first, or 
playing basketball at Jefferson High School. I, I was already graduated. I was five years older than he is. I was already graduated. I was in college. I was almost through with my first year in college. And I'd go over to Jefferson and we'd play half court and so on. And we, I, I got on the team opposite of him. I looked at him and I said, who the hell is that? The guy looked so big. He was 14 years old. I mean, he was so big. I said, hey, that guy's big. And I went up for a rebound with him. I mean, I, I threw up in, in, a, in a car crash. I mean, that, that guy had elbows and, and I mean, he, he was just I'll stop it there because I've just been told we have two minutes to two go. Minutes. We want to go ahead and do Not our bolita time. drawing. We will put the rest of that interview with Ferdy on our website. We promise we'll do that. We just want to thank Ferdy also for giving us his time this afternoon. Jack. And we're gonna, Jack. Of course. No, Jack's coming back because Jack's got a book coming out. <laughs> and if we're going to sell Papa Bear's book, we're going to sell Jack's <laughs> exactly. book as well. Yeah. And we'll read. save a little bit of time on that on that show to finish <laughs> the stories because I saw him checking off stories here that he didn't get a chance to tell us. <laughs> so we may start the story with the end of the Rick Caceres and then pick up with Good Jack. Idea. Good we're going to give away this T-shirt tonight to one lucky winner. This is our 50-year uh, anniversary T-shirt for one lucky winner. And I've been uh, these are methodically jotting down you've got numbers, numbers throughout there, the show. I, I'm ready. All right, let's go, let's Jack. Go. Get in there and get you one. Get in there and get you one. Pick a good one, son. This is like the good old days. Pick you a good one, like the good old days. La bolita. <laughs> La bolita. Yeah. And the winning number. Closest two without going over. Number. Wow, it's almost close to 31. Number 31. 31. Number 31. That would be. Well, closest two is Alyssa Governale. Alyssa yes. Governale is our winner tonight. That's Alyssa, right. Congratulations. Reach out to us. We'll get that shirt to you. We'll meet you someplace, or we can mail it to you, certainly, as well. Like congratulations. <laughs> Jack, do you believe it's over? 45 seconds. Wow. Unbelievable. God, uh, flew by. I don't know if I've got time to tell you that I wrote a letter on his behalf, and uh, he called me because I sent him a copy, and i got to tell you this. He calls me on the phone. He says, Jack Wilkins, I put a little note that said, I lied about how great you are in this letter. He calls me to thank me about the letter, and he says, Jacko, let me tell you, you lied very well. He says, I'm going to take this letter, I'm going to put it in my blue suit, and when I die, I'm going to take it with me. Oh, my goodness. And oh, raise our three days later, make. he's gone. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Tampa Native Show, I'm Mario Nunez. Salud, Salud and, happy, and happy, days happy days to you, Rick Caceres. Thank you so See much. See you next week. God See bless you, you all. Thank you. Back when we were younger. And everything seemed new We used to have a lot of fun Yes we did No matter what we do Sleepy days, long summer nights Going anywhere we please With love that I could call my own Love that I've always known The city that I call my home A home from which I never roam This love affair was meant to be and she loves me I remember Tampa Oh, she remembers me She remembers me Tampa Native Show.